Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe. It's good to see you here. And it doesn't really matter what time you're joining us, whether it's the morning, the afternoon, or the evening. You are very, very welcome. And if this is your first entrance to the World Storytelling Cafe, I could highly recommend you getting yourself a little drinky poos. Maybe a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, uh, maybe a hot chocolate if you're joining us in the evening. Or throw caution to the wind. doesn't matter if it's the morning, you can have a hot chocolate, can't you? Or you can maybe get yourself into something a little bit stronger and uh, settle down and uh, enjoy the plethora of storytellers who have taken the time to record their tales for your wonderment and delight. And I can tell you there are some cracking tales out there at the World Storytelling Cafe. And if you're enjoying the stories at the World Storytelling Cafe and the storytellers themselves, if you look carefully on the website, there's a little hat symbol. And that hat symbol is for you to, if you would like to, show your appreciation for the time and effort people are putting into recording the stories to entertain you by putting a little tip into uh, the hat. And I can uh, tell you that the all proceeds go directly to the storyteller that you're tipping. So if you just look out for the storyteller you want to tip and pop them something in the hat, I'm sure, like me, who's uh, lost all their work uh, for most of this year now, uh, um, they would be very, very, very grateful for a little uh, a little nod and tip of uh, the hat. Uh, anyway, I shall stop prattling on and uh, tell you some stories if you're up for it. I've been thinking about what stories to tell you and I've uh, put a little set together. And uh, hopefully I can record them without making too many mistakes. Uh, it's tricky when you're recording them rather than doing it live. When you do it live, you can get away with all sorts of things. When it's, uh, when it's recorded, every little uh, mistake seems to, seems to resonate a little bit more. So I'll see what I can do for you. So whether you last 40 minutes or whether you last uh, just a little bit less than that. My name's Ian Douglas. I'm your storyteller. And I hope you enjoy the stories. And the first story I thought I'd tell you this afternoon is a story that I've collected from a friend of mine who lives uh, all the way down in Cornwall. At this time when we can't get out to see each other, uh, you get to thinking a lot about your friends. I'm sure you're doing the same thing, thinking about people you can't get to see, catching up with them on social media. Uh, well, uh, one of my oldest friends is a man called Gary Cordingly, and he lives down in Cornwall, and he is a storyteller, and I've known him for quite a long time. He, I remember him telling this story, and... Uh, it was one of those stories that went straight in here and straight back out here. So I hope he doesn't mind uh, me telling this story. Uh, and it goes something like this. Uh, if you go to the north of England, just before you reach the border to Scotland, you'll come to a place called Northumberland, uh, next to Cumbria. And Northumberland has uh, many fine things in it to go and see and visit. Uh, when finally we're allowed out. But uh, one of the things you could do if you're ever up in Northumberland is you could go and visit the beautiful town of Hexham. And I was very lucky to be in Hexham not too long ago and was looking forward to actually later on this month being part of the Hexham Book Festival. But never mind, it looks like that one may be a virtual thing as well. So this story comes from Hexham. And if you can't quite picture Hexham, it's an old, old town and it goes up the side of a hill and there's a castle in Hexham, like there is in many uh, old uh, old towns. And once upon a time, there was a lord that lived in the castle in Hexham. And the lord who lived in the castle in Hexham, he was a very unhappy man. And the reason he was unhappy because, was because his many tenants that lived in Hexham, they weren't very happy. And the re reason they weren't very happy is because times were hard. And people didn't have a great deal of money in their pockets. Something I feel most days. And of course, when the poor need to complain, who do they take their complaints to? Well, they take them to the door of them that's got it. The rich. And so every single day, the Lord of Hexham found his head throbbing from the sound of people constantly knocking on his door and complaining at him, you see. And all he wanted was to find one day of peace, one day of rest. And so early one morning, he just got out of bed and he was sat on the edge of his bed in his robes. And he was scratching his head and thinking, how could he gain just a day of peace? 
and suddenly an idea came to his mind. He thought, that's it. What I'll do is I'll have a party. Well, who doesn't like a party? And I'll, uh, I'll show people such a good time that the following day they'll stay in their beds. They'll be so tired from the party. They'll stay in their beds, so content. They'll stay in their beds and they'll give me a day of peace. And so he goes from his bed and uh, across to the wall and on the wall there there's a great red rope and he holds out his hand and he pulls on the red rope and somewhere down in the bowels of the castle a little bell rings and it rings in the room of Godfrey and Godfrey is the Lord of Hexham's servant. Well, Godfrey jumps up and as quick as a flash he runs up the stairs to the chambers of the Lord of Hexham. He goes inside and he bows low and he says, yes, my lord. Godfrey, says the Lord of Hexham, I've got a task for you. We're going to have a party, Godfrey, for all the tenants in Hexham. And to make that a successful party, I need you to do something for me. I need you to take this bag of gold and I want you to travel with a horse and cart down into the great market of Hexham. And I want you to buy with this bag of gold as much beer, wine, breads, fine meats, puddings, juice for the children, as you can. Pile it as high as you can on the cart and bring it back. We're going to have a, a bit of a shindig. Yes, my lord, said Godfrey. Now, hang on a said Godfrey, said the Lord of Hexham. I've also got another task. When you've bought all the beers and wines and breads and cheeses and juice for the children, I want you to take this second bag of gold and I want you to go back into the market. For there's a stall in Hexham Market, I'm told, that has trinkets from all around the world. I want you to buy a trinket, a small gift for every tenant in Hexham as a sign of appreciation. Yes, my lord, said Godfrey. And as quick as a flash, he took the two bags of gold. He went down to the stables, he got a horse and cart and he set off into the great market in Hexham. Now, this is an old story. And Hexham, at the time of this story, was one of the great markets. It stretched right across the town, in fact, beyond the bounds of the town itself. It was so big. And Godfrey was hard-pressed uh, to buy all the things he needed, breads and wines and beers and cheeses, and he piled them as high as he could upon the cart, and he turned tail and he went back to the castle. He handed the reins of the horse to another servant, and then he went to complete the task. He took a second bag of gold, he went back down into the market to find the stall. And it took him quite a long time, but eventually... He saw the right stall. He could see there were unusual trinkets that looked like they'd travelled from afar. Well, Godfrey went down to that stall. But the problem was, when he got there, he couldn't get to the trinkets. Because there was a man stood there who just seemed to block all of the space in front of him. He just couldn't get round him. So if he couldn't get round him, he would have to go through him. And so Godfrey stretched out his hand and without thinking twice, tapped the man roughly on the shoulder to get his attention, to tell him to move. But as the man turned, Godfrey suddenly realised that it was no man at all. For no man has ever stood over ten feet tall, dressed from head to foot in a long black cloak, a skull-like face with two bright blue eyes. Out from the arms of that cloak were two thin, bony arms. And in one of them, he clasped a, a scythe with a blade on it that was so sharp, it looked like it would cut the sun itself. This was no man. This was death himself. And death turned and he raised his arms and he looked Godfrey right in the eyes. And Godfrey, he gave out a scream. Ah! And then he ran as quick as he could away from the market. And he went all the way back to the castle. He went up the stairs. He went into the chambers of the Lord of Hexham. He was sweating and he was white in the face like he'd seen a ghost. And the Lord of Hexham said, Godfrey, whatever is the matter? My Lord, said Godfrey, I did today as you bade me do. I went down into the market of Hexham and I bought the beers and the wines and the cheeses and the breads and the juice for the children and piled them high up on the cart and brought them back to the castle. And then I went back into the market to find the stall with the trinkets from all around the world. But my lord, when I got there, there was a man in the way who just seemed to take up all the space and I couldn't get round him. So if I couldn't get round him, I had to go through him. And so I tapped him on the shoulder and he turned. But my lord, it was no man. It was death. 
and death looked me in the eyes and raised his arms in menace and you know as well as i do what it means when death looks you in the eyes and raises his arms in menace my lord what am i going to do calm down said the lord of hexen godfrey you have always been a faithful servant what kind of man would i be if i didn't aid you in your time of need let me think ah i know godfrey this is what i want you to do go now from my chamber and go down into the stable where you'll find my own brown horse it's the fastest horse in all the land put a saddle on that horse and jump onto that saddle and travel as quick as you can to carlisle because death wouldn't think to find you in carlisle oh, yes my lord said godfrey and he left the chamber of the Lord of Hexham and he went all the way down the stairs. He went down into the stables. He found the brown horse that belonged to the Lord of Hexham. He saddled that horse. He jumped into the saddle and in a cloud of dust, he took to the A69 and he travelled to Carlisle. But that left the Lord of Hexham in his chambers, vexed, nay, angry, because today, because of death, he had lost his two favourite things. And he decided it was time to have it out with death himself. And so he put on his fine robe and he went down the stairs and out into the market. And eventually, after much seeking, he found the stall that had trinkets on it from all around the world. And there still stood death, dithering over a gift. But the Lord of Hexham, he went straight over towards death and he tapped him roughly on the shoulder. And death turned. And the Lord of Hexham looked him in the eye and said, Now listen here, death. All because of you today, I've lost my two favourite things. My good servant Godfrey and my fine brown horse. All because you looked Godfrey in the eyes and raised your arms in menace. And you know as well as I do what it means when you looked somebody in the eyes and raised your arms in menace. Now what have you got to say for yourself? But suddenly... Death lowered him down from his great height and looked the Lord of Hexham right in the eyes. But he looked confused. And he said, My Lord, I didn't look Godfrey in the eyes and raise my arms in menace at all. I looked him in the eyes and raised my arms in surprise. Surprised to see Godfrey here in Hexham, for I have an appointment with him this very evening in Carlisle. And that, dear friends, is the end of the story of the Lord of Hexham. I thank you. Well, there's our first little story. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Mr. Cordingly. And it turns my attention to uh, other friends that we haven't seen for a while. And I was thinking, uh, being as uh, you probably, uh, if you've ever met me before and you've uh, spent time around a fire at maybe a festival, or some other venue where we've been telling stories, you uh, you probably know, because I am uh, quite fond of telling people, that we live on a, on a boat. And uh, I thought maybe I'd tell you a boating story. And it's uh, I'm fairly certain it's probably a story you've never heard before. And it was a story that was given to me by a man called Dave Reed. Now, you might not know Dave, but uh, if you live in the kind of Leak Staffordshire area, the Staffordshire Moorlands area, you possibly might know Dave. He's, uh, he's a folk musician and he's also one of the people who helps organise the Leak Arts Day. And Dave's been very kind to book me for the last couple of years to come to the Arts Day and tell stories. So, um, Dave, thank you very much. He gave me this story. Uh, he's uh, often to be found at the end of the bar at the Hollybush Inn at Denford which sadly is closed at the moment due to the coronavirus uh, but I'm sure it'll be open again someday and we'll see Dave again down there but he gave me this story a few years ago and uh, it's a quick it's, it's a cute little story I hope you enjoy it and it goes a little bit like now I must start actually by telling you this now I'm a Yorkshireman proud born and bred and as far as I'm concerned there are a few delicacies in life but there's nothing finer than a well-made Yorkshire pudding and, uh, of course, if you're from Yorkshire, you are taught the secret ingredient. I'm afraid I'm not able to tell you the secret ingredient uh, because uh, it's kept only for people from Yorkshire. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing finer. It is the elixir. It is the ambrosia of life as a fine Yorkshire pudding. But 
I will uh, tell you this. I have come across something that uh, that um, is is up there, and that's the Staffordshire oat cake. And if you can get yourself a, a freshly made Staffordshire oat cake, that is fresh off the stove, maybe with a fried egg inside it. It's a fine little uh, little ditty to eat, especially with a pint of ale. Uh, but anyway, so this story concerns oat cakes as well, and it goes like this. Once upon a time, a long time ago, there was an old lady called Mary. Now, Mary lived on a boat just like me. Her boat was about 40 foot long, and at the back of the boat, there was an old stove, and Mary would use that stove early in the morning to make oat cakes, and she would make as many as she could in the time that she had. She would rise really early and make up the batter and get it onto the stove. And she would make them, and, and when they were hot, she would wrap them in paper. And when she did enough, she'd travel away from the boat and up towards the potteries of Stoke-on-Trent, and she'd sell them at the gates of the potteries in, of a morning. And the workers were going to work, you see. And her oat cakes were so good. People would say, Mary, those oat cakes would tempt the devil himself. Now, Mary would hear this often, but she didn't like it because Mary was a godly woman. She was very devout and she was fearful of the devil. And just in case the devil ever decided to come and visit to get one of her oat cakes, she would keep the rosary close to her, you see, and would always say her prayers. But I'll tell you something about Mary. Mary spent so much time thinking about oat cakes that she didn't spend a lot of time thinking about herself. Her boat was so unkept, the paint was stripping off and... Her Mary's clothes were tattered and frayed and people worried about her. Now one evening she's making her way home after a good day selling the oat cakes and as she's going along the towpath she suddenly remembers that she's forgotten to get herself some kindling. Now she's got plenty of coal for the fire for the morning but she's got no kindling. Without any kindling there's a good chance she won't get the coal to light. So she starts to look down the hedgerows as she's walking down the towpath to see if she can find some dry wood that she can use to light the stove. But suddenly she looks and she can see there's a, a row of boats and they're all moored on the side of the canal there. And there's no finer sight, she thinks to herself, than the moored boats and the twinkly twilight night. All their lights lit inside and the stovepipes sending the smoke straight up into the air. It's a cold and still night. When suddenly she looks at the boat that's moored up just behind hers and she sees there's a little stack of kindling on the back deck and she thinks to herself, do you know, well, it wouldn't be stealing and ungodly if I took a few of those sticks but replaced them in the morning, like for like. And so she makes a decision and she steps a foot onto the boat and she picks up a few of those kindling sticks and she puts them under her arm and as quick as a flash she runs off down the towpath to her boat she goes inside, she puts a spark to the kindling, gets it going and puts the coal on there. And before you know it, she's got that stove nice and hot and it'll keep in for the morning, you see. But I'll tell you something, and here's the truth. You should never, ever, ever step on somebody's boat without asking first. It's very, very bad. And what you can do is go up to the side of the boat and knock and, uh, and uh, don't look in. That's also uh, not a done thing either. Waiting to be invited on, you see. And I'll tell you another thing as well. When you've lived on a boat for a while, you get to know how the boat moves. And you can always tell if somebody stepped on your boat, you see, the way that the boat rocks from side to side. And the man who owned that boat was actually on the boat. Mary didn't know. And he was on the boat and he felt the boat rock like somebody had stepped on it. As quick as a flash, he'd run up to his back hatch to have a look out, but there was nobody there. But his suspicions were raised, you see. Well, let's skip to the second night of the story. Mary's had a good day up at the pottery selling the oat cakes. And she's making her way back down towards the boat. And again, she remembers, ah, she's forgotten to get kindling. And not only that, she hasn't even replaced the stuff from the night before. But she's tired. She's an old woman and she hasn't got the time to go out trying to collect kindling. She looks on the boat again and there's that little stack of kindling on the back of the boat there. And she thinks to herself, do you know, well... Once is ungodly, second time, well, that's theft. But if she replaces it in the morning, well, all would be well, and God would forgive her. So once again, she makes the decision. She steps her foot onto the back of the boat. She picks up a bit of kindling, and she heads back to her boat. She puts a spark to the kindling, puts the coal on top, and before you know it, she's got that stove 
uh, roaring merrily, and it'll be enough to stay in for the next morning. But the fellow on the boat was ready this night, and he was peeking out through the hatch, and he saw Mary take the kindling, you see. Well, he doesn't confront her. But an idea comes to his mind, and he thinks, right. First time he's ungodly, second time he's stealing, and a third time, well, as you probably know yourself, three is the charm in stories. If Mary comes back a third time, I'll be ready for her, thinks the man. Well, the next morning, up gets Mary. She stokes up the fire. She gets the oat cakes cooking. She gets some wrapped in paper and she goes. And the man sees her going up the towpath. And he sets to work. He goes to the back of his boat and he picks up the kindling that's at the back of his boat and he takes it inside. And he goes to one of the drawers in the boatman's cabin. And inside the drawer, there's a tin. And in that tin is something that's called black powder. Now, if you don't know what black powder is, you'll know, well, I'll tell you, it's gunpowder. Now, I don't know why he's got it. The story doesn't tell. But I can tell you what he does with it. He takes a needle, a thin needle that he uses normally to darn the cover for his hatch, the canvas, you see. And he starts to stick that needle into the end of the kindling to make little holes, you see. And when he's satisfied there's enough holes in the kindling, he takes the black powder and he carefully stuffs the black powder into the kindling, hides it so it can't be seen. And when he's done, he takes the kindling back outside and he puts it onto the back deck. And then he sits inside the boat, smokes his pipe, drinks his tea and he waits. Well, that evening, the third evening of the story, Mary is indeed coming back down the towpath. And for the third time, she's forgotten kindling. But this night, she doesn't even think about replacing it. This has become a habit now. Once he's gotten godly, twice is theft. Third is the devil's work. Well, of course, she steps on the boat, she picks up some of that kindling, and she takes off towards her boat. She goes inside, she goes to the stove, she opens up the stove door and she puts the kindling inside there, and she sets a spark to that kindling and gets it lit. And then she closes the door and waits for it to start to roar. Well, of course, what she doesn't know is that that kindling is stuffed full of black powder, gunpowder. And suddenly, there's a great big boom. Boom! And when the smoke settles, there stands Mary. Now, her dress isn't tattered anymore. It's scorched. And her hair's standing on end. And her face is all sooted up. And as the soot settles in the boat, she can see that the stove, well, the pipe of the stove, has blown clear out the top of the boat and is now in the cut in the water. But Mary doesn't know anything about the black powder inside that kindling. And all she can think that it's, is that it's old scratch, that it's the devil himself, and that he's come down the stovepipe and he's going to come out of that fire to steal her oat cakes. And so as quick as a flash, Mary, she packs up that boat, she turns on the engine and in the darkness she sets off from the Calden Canal, past the potteries and away from Stoke-on-Trent and she was never seen on the Calden Canal again. But the old boater, he sat, he heard that boom, he heard the boat leave and he smoked on his pipe that night, he drank his tea and he chuckled. <laughs> and that, dear friends, is the end of that story. I thank you. Well, you know, when you think about friends and friendship, especially in these times when you can't see people, you think about the people who have helped you and have been there for you. And I was thinking this morning about my good friend, uh, Mr. Bridgins, Mr. Gary Bridgins. And I, I think, I'm hoping, that Mr. Bridgins is going to make an appearance on the World Storytelling Cafe at some point. He might even be thinking about a set of stories at this moment in time, I'm hoping. But I was thinking of him this morning. And I was thinking of a, a story that I might tell for my friend Gary, because I dedicate stories for all sorts of people who are having birthdays and things, but I've never dedicated a story for my friend Gary Bridgins before. So, Mr Gary Bridgins, this story is a story about friendship, and it's all for you. And it goes something like this. Once upon a time, there was a traveller, a travelling man. And this travelling man, he would travel the length and breadth of the country, North, South, East and West. 
Uh, well, I must tell you about this man, you see. This man was one of the kindest men you could ever, ever think of. A bit like Gary himself. He always had a good word to say to somebody. If you were down, he'd sing you a song. If you were hungry, he'd share his food. There was always a place at his table for you. And he made his table wherever he travelled. If you were poor, he'd share his money. If you were thirsty, he'd share his ale. Well, one day the man was travelling north and it was winter time and the winter was coming in thick and hard. It had been snowing for many days. And to get some shelter from the snow, he decided to go through the trees, through the forests, through the woodlands. And it was night time and he was thinking about settling down for the night. <clears throat> when suddenly, off in the distance, he heard a strange sound. And as he listened carefully to that sound, he could hear that it was the sound of an animal and that the animal was in distress. Well, he didn't want to leave an animal in distress, you see. This was a kind man, a man with a good heart. And he know, knew that it would pay us to look after the spirits that live in the forests, you see. And so he travelled towards that sound. It was way off in the distance. And he had to come off the path and into the trees. And he trudged through the trees, he trudged through the snow and the darkness, until eventually he came to a clearing. And as he came to the clearing, he peered into the clearing and suddenly his eyes opened wide. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. There in the centre of the clearing, there was an animal. Well, he'd seen brown bears before. He'd seen black bears before. and He was very fearful of them. But he'd never in his life seen a pure white bear. And when he looked, he could see that that white bear, it had its paw caught in the trap of a hunter, and he could see on the white fur of the bear, there was blood, specks of blood. And he could hear the pain in the voice of the animal. But he could also see how big that animal was. He could see its black claws coming out from the white fur. He could see as it opened up its great mouth, the great white teeth. And he knew that animal could finish him off in a swipe or just one bite. And part of him wanted to leave that clearing. But the other part couldn't see that animal uh, left there in pain. And so he swallowed his fear and he did the right thing. He stepped into the clearing towards the animal. But the moment he made a sound, the animal forgot all about the pain and looked up and sniffed him. But the man didn't stop. He went towards that animal, even though he could hear the rumble of the growl of the animal as he got closer and closer. Well, he didn't want to look it in the eyes because he didn't want the animal uh, to be fearful of him or to, or to attack him. He didn't know what the animal was going to do. And so he lowered his gaze down towards the ground and he got close enough. He could see the paw of the bear. It was the, the size of his head. And then he did the bravest thing he could do. He stretched out his two hands and he prized open the trap to release the bear. And then slowly he stood up and he made to leave. And that's when the bear pounced. Ooh. And it jumped on top of him and it pinned him down to the ground. And the great head of the bear came face to face with his. And it showed its teeth. And he knew in that moment he breathed his last breath. But he hadn't, because suddenly the bear did the most wonderful thing. It took out its big, wet, black tongue, and it licked him a kiss up his face. Well, the man couldn't believe it. And slowly he took his hand, and he swallowed deeply, but he put his hand up on top of the head of the bear and ruffled its white fur. And the bear kissed him again. Well, the bear released the man and he stood up and he looked the bear clean in the eyes. And in that moment, their friendship was cemented. But the man knew that he had to travel on, you see, and so he made to leave the bear behind. He walked away from the clearing, but as he turned round, he realised that the bear was coming with him. Well, the man tried to shush the, boar, uh, the bear away, but it wouldn't turn. It came with him, you see, and so... They were companions and they walked together. They travelled north, south, east, west and wherever he went, the bear went with him. 
And if the bear was hungry and couldn't find food, the man, well, he would go to the town. He would use what little money he had and he would buy food for the pair of them. And if the man had no, mon no money, the bear would hunt and bring back fish, which they roast on a fire and eat together. And in summer, when it was so hot that the bear could hardly, uh, hardly uh, suffer the heat of the sun, the man would find a river and they would swim. And in winter time, when the man was so cold that even his coat wouldn't keep him warm and the f or heat of the fire wouldn't keep him warm, the great bear would wrap its great arms around him and the fur that it wore would keep him warm. But this winter was so bad, so cold, that not even the fur of the white bear could keep the man warm. And the man knew that they needed help. They needed shelter. So they travelled. And eventually, as they travelled through some trees, in the distance the man saw a light, and he knew it was the light of an house. And he decided he would go and ask for help. But as he was walking towards the house, he thought, well, in the darkness here, if they are to see the white bear, they're going to be fearful. And he asked the bear to hide round the side of the house. And he went to the door and he knocked. Well, he waited some time until eventually the door opened, just a crack. And there in the doorstep, there was an old man. And the old man was wizened with her little glasses, half glasses on his face, and he was holding a candle in a shaking hand. And he looked beyond the man and he could see at the side of a table there was a, a woman who looked like his wife and their daughter, a young girl. And the old man asked him what he wanted. And he said, listen, it's so cold outside that me and my companion were sure to freeze. Would you let us in and warm ourselves by your fire? And the man said, listen, I can see it's cold outside, but you can't come in. He said, it's so cold outside and the snow is falling so thickly that we shall surely freeze. Would you let us come in? He said, I can see that the snow's falling, but you can't come in. He said, listen, if we stay outside much longer, we're sure to freeze. And would you want that on your conscience? I wouldn't want it on my conscience, said the old man, but you can't come in. And eventually he asked for wine, and the man said, well, it's the Boggles. Well, you've never heard of Boggles. They're strange little creatures. They stand no higher than this. They're bald upon their heads. They've got large saucer eyes and long stretching fingers, and what they like to eat more than anything is children. And they come here every night, for they live across there in the trees. A gang of a hundred and fifty of them, they crash and they bash my door down. They're after my daughter, you see, when we lock ourselves upstairs so they can't get to us. And if I let you inside, they're sure to get to you. And I wouldn't have that on my conscience either. Well, suddenly the man scratched his head and he looked at the old man and he said, Did I introduce you to my friend? And he whistled for the white bear. Well, when the man saw the white bear, his eyes opened wide and he welcomed them inside. Well, they went inside and the man, he took off his coat for the fire was so warm. The white bear was so tired from the journey of the day that he curled up by the side of the fire, went straight to sleep, snored merrily. Well, they sat and they ate bread together and food together. They drank tea until eventually it was time for bed. And the old man bade them good night and safety and hoped they would see him in the morning. They went the man and his wife and the daughter up the stairs, locked the door. And the man waited by the side of the fire. Until eventually, outside, he heard a sound. The sound of laughter. <laughs> well, he went to the window and he wiped away the frost and looked outside. He couldn't see anything. And so he waited by the fire again. Still the white bear snoring merrily to itself when he heard the sound again. Well, he went to the window again and he had a look. And could he see anything? Oh, yes, he could. He could see by the line of the trees 150 pairs of shining eyes, teeth, claws and flappy feet. And suddenly the boggles came rushing towards the house and they started to smash and they started to crash until eventually the door splintered open. Well, the man, he sat down by the side of the fire and he watched as the boggles went about their business and they turned that room upside down. They turned over the table, they smashed the chairs over the wall, they threw plates across the room, they brought the room asunder. But all the time, the man just sat patiently by the fire, the white bear, he snored gently. 
Well, there was one little boggle no bigger than this, and he was white from the tip of his head to the tip of his toes, who was feeling quite mischievous and hungry, who had his head in the fridge. And he brought out on a fork a sausage that was twice the length of him. He was about to bite down on it when suddenly he noticed the white bear by the side of the fire. Well, I told you he was mischievous and he was also curious and had never seen a white bear before. And so he approached the white bear who opened up its eyes. And the boggle wafted the sausage under his nose and said, Wood, kitty like a sausage. The bear looked at the sausage and sniffed. <laughs> So the boggle tried again. He wafted it even closer under the bear's nose and said, Wood, kitty like a sausage! And again the bear he sniffed. <sniffs> so the boggle tried one more time. Wood, kitty like a sausage! And the bear said, Aah! And he swiped, and he swiped, and he swiped, until he'd bitten Every boggle on the bun. And they ran out from the house screaming into the snow. And they never came there again. Well, in the morning, when the old man, his wife and child came down the stairs and unlocked the door, they came into the room expecting to see the detritus of the night before. So they were pleasantly surprised to see that the room, well, it was perfect. The table was righted, the chairs were fixed, the plates were in the cupboards. There was no mess at all. And that morning, they shared bread with the travelling man and the white bear, until eventually it was time for them to get on the road once more, and off they went. And you know, they never saw the white bear and the man again, but the boggles. Well, the following evening, as the man sat at his table with his wife and child, they heard a sound outside in the snow. Excuse me? Excuse me? Well, the man, he went to the door and he opened it wide and he could see by the tree line a hundred and fifty pairs of eyes. And he said, what is it you want? And the boggle said, excuse me, have you still got that big white cat in there? I have, said the man, and she's just had kittens, so clear off. And the boggles, they ran screaming over the hill and all the way down to the town of Whitehaven. And apparently... That's where they live to this very, very day. And that's the end of the story for my friend Gary. And I hope you've enjoyed it. And we've got time, sadly, just for one more quick story, if you can but manage it. And I thought I would tell this story uh, for my wife. And she asked me uh, quite often to tell this story. And uh, I, I was very lucky uh, a number of years ago while, uh, to be apprenticed to a master storyteller uh, a man called Taffy Thomas, MBE. And during the time uh, of uh, my apprenticeship, uh, he was the first laureate for storytelling. So I was with him at a very special time uh, and learned lots from Taffy and, uh, and still continue to learn lots from Taffy. And in particular, I learned lots of stories from him and I thought I would tell you this story. As I did in my first set, I told a story from Taffy and I said this uh, at the time. I said, when I tell you the story, I'm thinking about him and the way he told me this story. It's a wise old story that my wife loves. Uh, so, Joe, uh, this is a story from Taffy through me to you and, of course, anybody else is listening. You're quite uh, uh, liberty to enjoy the story yourself. And it's the last story I'll tell you and it's a story... Well, you'll see. I'm sure you'll get the measure of it. There's a deep truth inside this story. There was once a king and a queen who had a son. He was called the prince. Now, this prince, he was bone idle. He was lazy. And whilst everybody did all the work, he would lay on the sofa, watching telly and drinking his favourite cup of juice. Well, it saddens me to tell you, and I don't know how it happened because Taffy never told me, but the king and the queen... They died. And suddenly, well, they do say, do they not? The king is dead. Long live the king. The prince, he found himself with a crown on his head. Well, Taffy will tell you this. Some people, they seize responsibility. Some people are handed responsibility. And some people have responsibility forced down upon their shoulders. Well, on the very same day that that young prince became the king, stories started to arrive from the mountains. 
that a giant had arrived, who was so ferocious that nobody dared pass. In fact, if you went high up into the mountains, you could hear the words of the giant. And you can learn them and say them with me if you like. Swish, swash, bang, boom. I am your nightmare. I am your doom, followed by a splat as the great big hairy foot of the giant would come down and kill you, squash you like a cow pat. Well, one day they came to the young king and they said, Your Majesty, that giant's so ferocious that people, they're no longer coming through the mountains. They're not bringing trade anymore. Without trade, we'll have no food. With no food, we shall starve. You shall do something about that giant. Well, the young king, he scratched his head. He wondered what to do until eventually an idea came to his mind. Of course, because he was king. He had an army and he called together his knights and he said tomorrow you'll take your armour and your swords and you'll climb up on your horses. You'll go up into the mountains and you'll kill that giant for me. They thought well that's what we get paid for so that's what we should do. And on the morning they put on their armour, they gathered their swords, they climbed under the horses and they did as the king bade them do and they went up through the mountains until eventually they heard the words of the giant. Do you remember? Swish, swash, bang, boom. I am your nightmare. I am your doom, followed by a splat. As the great big hairy foot of the giant came down and killed half of them, stone dead. Well, the other half, they ran back down the mountain. They went back to the king and they said, Your Majesty, that giant is too ferocious for us. He's your giant. You'll have to deal with him. Well, that night... The young king, he sat and scratched his head. He wasn't sure what to do. Well, let me tell you something, because it's true. It doesn't matter how old or wise you think you are. You always need a teacher. I have one. His name is Tammy T Taffy Thomas. I can go and speak to him if ever I'm doubtful about something or I need some advice. Well, the young king, he had a teacher, and her name was Sophia. She was the librarian in the castle, you see, and he went to see Sophia and she listened to the problem of the giant and eventually she offered him a solution. So he said, Your Majesty, I've got some words for you that might solve your problem. She said, What at first you do not know will always seem to grow and grow and it will stand in your way until its name you learn to say. The young king said, Just tell me those words again. And uh, maybe you could say them with me, if you can remember them. What at first you do not know will always seem to grow and grow, and it will stand in your way until its name you learn to say. Well, armed with those words, the young king, he went out from the library, he thanked Sophia, and he went to see all the subjects of the castle, and he said, tomorrow I shall face the giant myself. And that's exactly what he did. He took off his armour the next day and he laid down his sword and all alone. And people thought he must have gone mad, the young king. He went up into the mountains all by himself. Until eventually he was so high up in the mountains he heard the words of the giant. Do you remember? Swish. Swash. Bang. Boom. I am your nightmare. I am your doom. Followed by a... Well, the splat didn't come. Because they do say that forewarned is forearmed. And as the great big hairy foot came down, the young king, he rolled clear. And as it hit the ground, bellows of dust went up into the air and then slowly settled. And that's when the young king saw the giant for the first time. And he felt it in his stomach. And all he wanted to do was run away and hide. But just as he was about to turn, he heard, like a whisper on the wind, the words of Sophia, do you remember? What at first you do not know will always seem to grow and grow and it will stand in your way until its name you learn to say. And armed with those words, that young king did the bravest thing he'd ever done. He took one step towards the giant. But the strangest thing, as he stepped towards the giant, he could see that the giant didn't seem to look quite as big as it had before. And so he took another step, and another, and with every step that giant got smaller and smaller and smaller, until he was the size of a mouse. 
And that young king, he kicked, picked up the giant and he looked that tiny little giant right in the eyes and he said, giant, what's your name? And the giant looked the king in the eyes and said, your majesty, my name is Fear. Well, that's the end of that little tale. And I've just looked at the clock and it says that it's also the end of our time together. So in these days where we are facing uh, something that we could potentially be fearful of, just remember that there's hope everywhere in the world. And one day we'll be able to step out, we'll be able to step towards that giant and it won't seem as big as at first it, it seemed to be. And we'll be able to dance merrily in the fields again and we'll be able to gather around fires and tell stories and, and, uh, and share songs and jokes and we'll look back at this time. But never, ever, 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 and I heard these words this morning, will I ever, ever uh, say no to a hug? Because uh, those are things that are sadly missing at this moment in time, uh, especially with friends we can't see. And so I send my, much love out and much light out to all of you uh, uh, wherever you are in the world. And I hope you've enjoyed the stories. And just remember, if you have enjoyed the stories and you can but afford to do it, and I know some people can't, but if you can and you fancy putting a little tip into the hat, uh, well, I won't say no because uh, uh, we, I've got uh, family to feed as well. So um, uh, anyway, uh, that's about enough of that. Thanks very much. Much light to you all. Take care. And I'll see you on another road somewhere. Ta-ta for now. Bye-bye. And don't forget to log on to the World Storytelling Cafe and watch the other fantastic storytellers that are out there. They're amazing. I'm doing it and I'm learning lots from them. So um, ta-ta for now. Take care. Bye-bye. People, wherever you are, thank you for listening to that last storyteller. What an amazing performance. And if you enjoyed it, the hat, look just below the story. If you're on the website, and I do encourage you to go to the website, and you can put a little in the hat. If you're in Texas, you've got a Texas hat here. I've got this in Kerrville. You could drop a dollar in, or two. If you're in England, you can drop a pound in, or more. If you're in Canada, where well, you could drop a few dollars in. And maybe if you're right up north in Lapland, you could drop a few kroner in, or maybe a euro or two. It will be much appreciate it. Thank you. Don't forget the hat and enjoy the stories.